All right. So uh, while we are getting our participants in, um, I think we're close to having any, everybody in the meeting. Uh, and as soon as that happens, I'll start. But let me go through some uh, basic housekeeping things for the um, critical care training forum. So welcome, everybody, uh, to our uh, most recent edition of the COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum with the American Thoracic Society. Uh, we've been doing this every week through the pandemic, and it's every Tuesday from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern, because we know that's the most important coast, right? Um, today, we'll be covering pulmonary embolism in COVID-19, so I'm very excited because we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. I'm just briefly setting on, uh, stepping in for Dr. Kwadi Alexander, uh, but our presenters today, Dr. Morris, will be leading the bunch. We have Dr. Bond, who's the fellow, who will be doing a presentation, a clinical presentation, I believe, followed by our experts who will be providing their, um, uh, you know, experiences and then sharing some of the recent data for you. This is Dr. Fernandez, Shanik, and Tapson. Um, Dr. Shanik is also a new grandfather, so please feel free to <laughs> congratulate him in the chat along with letting us know where you're from. So you, you feel free to let, uh, start letting us know where you're from. Um, we, all of us uh, who are part of the planning crew, uh, have our uh, disclosures on the screen, but we don't believe that any of them directly impact the content of this presentation. Our objectives um, are to basically uh, make sure that we share the most recent evidence. Uh, and uh, for this, you will be getting CME credit. So please make sure you fill in the form and the feedback um, form as well, because that's how, I, how we improve our uh, content. This right here is the QR code. You can point your phones toward this, towards this QR code and it'll take you to the presentation. We'll also be sharing the link in the chat box through the presentation. Uh, and please, like I said, do share your feedback with us. It really makes a huge difference on the future iterations of this event. Uh, this right here is the list of topics we've covered in COVID-19, which now that I look at it, I feel like we should write a book. I'm not sure why this hasn't come up, but it's a good idea, I suppose. Uh, we've covered everything from hypoxemia to mechanical ventilation, all the way to the impact on me medical education and then post ICU care. So if you Google COVID-19 ATS critical care training form, you'll be able to look at all of these pre-recorded sessions, including some of these slides from these sessions. Um, I already covered these, uh, how to get to it. There's also this link, which we can share in the chat box as we go along. Uh, the topics that are coming up, uh, we have two of them, uh, very high impact topics, airway management and COVID-19, which has been a source of major anxiety right off the bat uh, and throughout. I'll be doing this next year with, uh, it'll be a multidisciplinary uh, conference with respiratory therapists, uh, anesthesia, ER, and critical care experts, so super excited. And then uh, we'll be closing the year out with the role of ECMO for the management of severely hypoxemic uh, patients with COVID-19. Finally, uh, huge thanks as always to our fantastic team of trainees who started this idea from a tiny seed and have grown it all the way to where it's become a uh, undertaking that we are super proud of. Uh, and uh, thank you to our ETS staff, Lauren, Liz, Eileen, and uh, Rebecca for their constant support. Uh, God knows how many texts they get from us every week. So please say thank you to them on our uh, behalf. So with that, I will sh stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Morris take over. And also um, one more uh, thing, please feel free to ask questions uh, specifically or in general over the chat box. We want to want this to be as engaging as possible. So um, uh, our experts can respond to you. My turn? Yes, sir. All yours. All right. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Laura, for, for the invitation. Thank you to the ATS, and thank you, Varen, for, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, my name is Tim Morris, and uh, I have the pleasure of uh, uh, heading up this wonderful group of, uh, of experts that are going to talk with us a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and pulmonary embolism and other forms of thrombosis in uh, pulmonary, uh, in uh, COVID-19. So uh, uh, that's me in the top there is Tim Morris. 
Uh, along with me here at UCSD is uh, Tim Fernandez, who is an expert in both acute and chronic pulmonary embolism. And he shares that with uh, Dr. Rich Chanick uh, up at UC um, Los Angeles and with Dr. Vic Tapson, uh, who is a pulmonary- What happened to the crowd noise for us, Tim? What's that? What happened to the crowd noise for us? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I think so, we had the laughter. <laughs> yeah. hey, there they are. <clears throat> I asked people to hold the applause till the end. Uh, and, then, and then Dan Bond, who is a, a one of our rising stars, a fellow here uh, at UCSD, who's going to be uh, uh, doing some clinical presentations for us. Um, so um, what are, we're, we're going to be over, going over tonight is uh, some pathological features of thrombosis in COVID-19. <clears throat> we're going to have a little discussion about macrothrombosis, like pulmonary embolism, the types of, of uh, VTE that we're used to seeing, and microthrombosis. We're going to touch a little bit about some recent information about serological markers, antibody markers in, in COVID-19 that have to do with thrombosis. We're going to discuss some epidemiology about pulmonary embolism and, uh, and uh, COVID-19. And then we're going to spend actually most of our time uh, discussing some cases and uh, get to some interesting decision points. <clears throat> so about the pathological features, um, COVID-19, when, when it causes ARDS, just like every other form of ARDS, <clears throat> it, uh, obviously involves some clotting. And uh, what you're seeing there, these green arrows, are that's the hyaline membranes that form with ARDS. And those hyaline membranes are formed partly by a congealed surfactant. But one of the things that makes this, this surfactant congeal is fibrin. And that's fibrin, just one of the proteins that exudates across into the alveolus. And fibrin uh, messes up alveoli, or this messes up surfactant in a particularly vicious way. And, and so it, not only does it make your oxygenation low, but it, the, there are several markers of thrombosis that will happen when, when that occurs. So people can look like they're clotting. And they actually are clotting in a very microscopic way. Um, this, this is a autopsy of a, one of the early patients from, uh, from New Orleans <clears throat> who um, has a different form of thrombosis here. And these are in situ thrombi that are formed way out in the periphery of his lungs. So this person died from acute respiratory failure. And you can see that zoomed picture right down here in the bottom right on, on my screen. And that is uh, one of the peripheral arteries that has a clot um, sitting inside of it. Uh, and on this person, the autopsy did not disclose any other emboli uh, besides these peripheral thrombi. There's nothing in the heart, nothing in the legs, et cetera. Um, and so the, the thought on this person, although we can never really prove it, but the thought is that these were in situ thrombi in relatively macroscopic uh, pulmonary arteries. Uh, interestingly enough, this is the same person who had just those relatively small thrombi, but he had a right ventricle, which was quite enlarged. And in fact, if you think about this, uh, this uh, specimen and you think about the types of views that you usually get with CT scanning or with echocardiogram, you can see that that, that right ventricle, which is on the left of your screen by the, by the C, is actually you know, large. It's larger than the left side and it's indenting the, uh, the um, intramedicular septum. So you have some, some uh, um, invasion of the space of the left ventricle. And ordinarily, we would look at that and say, this is acute right heart failure. Um, so, and, and even in the face of relatively small um, thrombi. And this is actually also the same person. And these are getting, we're getting smaller and smaller now. These are, are, are uh, arterioles, <clears throat> small arterioles. And you can see these active um, thrombi that are forming within the small arterioles. That thing on the right side is, is just stained for a, a platelet marker, a uh, 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 platelet factor 3A. Um, so you can see that that, that is, uh, if there's a lot of uh, active thrombi that are happening here. And then in the bottom left of your screen are even smaller arterioles. But what I wanted to show you here was that these are actually those green um, arrows, the green arrow and the, and the green triangle here are both pointing to megakaryocytes. So megakaryocytes those are where platelets come from. Uh, and and it it's odd to see those in an embolus, uh, just like if you know you had artillery was firing someplace, maybe there's gonna be shells that land there, but you don't expect to see the cannon over there. Um, and uh, so this uh, seeing a megakaryocyte in the middle of a, of a thrombus suggests that it, was, it grew there. So this is an in situ thrombus uh, that's happening in these small arterioles. <clears throat> 
And then if you were to uh, zoom in on some of this area, you can see where some of that is coming from because these sm small arterials have, uh, this is this area right over here. Let's make a little circle around it. That's an arterial and those are lymphocytes. Those are white cells um, uh, um, uh, inflaming it. So this is an, an, an angiitis, arteritis. Uh, this is a separate study uh, that looked, now we're getting even smaller, and now these are pulmonary um, capillaries, and you can see these little thrombi forming inside uh, pulmonary capillaries there. Uh, and this is an electron micrograph of the same patient, and the blue, actually the blue one is a normal person. That's what capillaries should look like on a scanning electron micrograph. But if you look at the, at the image uh, immediately to the right of it in panel B, you can just sort of see this bumpy kind of, you know, ratty looking um, uh, membranes there, which is actually some, some hyperplasia of the uh, capillary endothelium. And zooming in on that is panel C, where you can just sort of see this lumpy, bumpy, um, contours there, and uh, you, that'd be explained if you look at panel D, which is this, the, this uh, little area right there that, that they have an enlargement. This is the endothelial cell, capillary endothelial cell that's got invaded and in, uh, with the, or infected by the COVID virus. So the virus is actually invading the endothelial cells itself, causing some dysfunction, and then hence the insight to um, thrombosis. I'm going to turn things over uh, to my colleague, uh, Dr. Fernandez, who's going to take us a little bit down the road of discussing macro thromboses versus micro thromboses. All right. Thanks, Tim. Next slide. Next slide. So COVID-19 is really the, the perfect organism for generating these clots. Um, the combination of the inflammation from the virus and the hypoxia from the, the syndrome um, really uh, Puts, puts a lot of, um, there, there is a lot of thrombosis that can be seen. Um, and there are a couple of mechanisms by which uh, the coagulation cascade um, is, is primed to, to thrombose in COVID. So really coagulation evolved as a, a factor pathway of the immune response and neutrophils in the presence of, of bacteria, when they're activated, they release these um, nets, these neutrophil extracellular traps, their DNA sort of meshes that go out and try and trap these bacteria. And in the inflammatory milieu of a COVID infection, um, these neutrophils are very activated and you see these nets being released and that can lead to this uh, platelet aggregation. In addition, um, fibrin comes in after these, these nets are uh, released and, and platelets start aggregating. Fibrin comes in to further entrap what would be infected cells or bacteria. So those two things together um, really start this coagulation process. Next. That, in addition to the hypoxia that's seen in uh, severe COVID-19 infections, um, really um, leads to a prothrombotic state. Um, um, Hypoxia-inducible transcription factors like uh, HIF-1 HIF alpha really uh, um, in, generate these thrombus um, to be formed and it creates this cycle where um, HIF is activated, it um, leads to more vascular inflammation, which leads to more thrombus um, formation and um, leads to these, um, this thrombotic state. So next slide. All of that together leads to endothelial cell dysfunction. So the endothelial cells in the pulmonary artery um, have this impaired vascular tone. Um, there's this imbalance between the vasodilators and the vasoconstrictors, similar to what's seen in PAH. And um, as the endothelial cells get injured, they release tissue factors, which activate thrombin, and that further um, leads to, to more fibrin um, being deposited. Next slide. So that's what's going on on the, the micro level. And you know, Dr. Morris was showing a bunch of uh, pathology slides showing these um, microthrombi in small ar arteries and arterioles in, in the pulmonary vascular bed. And we have to keep that separate in our minds from the more macro thrombosis, these like saddle pulmonary embolisms, your, your typical um, submassive and massive pulmonary embolism that we um, like to discuss. Um, this is a, a little bit of a different entity. Um, and next slide. Um, so, you know, since COVID hit, uh, I've done a lot of time in our COVID ICU here in La Jolla. And early on, there was this talk of 
this is a different ARDS than, than the typical influenza ARDS that we see. Um, and um, uh, Gattinoni and others have described this high compliance, high dead space phenotype of COVID ARDS. So in, in the, the top panel there, this is um, a patient that has um, really high com compliance, but their, their issue is more of a dead space issue. Um, you don't see those, those typical dense infiltrates um, um, that, that are characteristic of mo what most people think of, of ARDS. There's the other, the B phenotype, the one that, that is more characteristic of, of what we've seen in influenza ARDS in the past. So early on in this pandemic, um, this idea of high dead space, dead space being a problem, microvascular thrombosis leading to dead space um, became really synonymous with COVID-19 ARDS. And um, so that led to a lot of uh, discussion about, you know, do we need to be considering anticoagulation to treat this dead space? Um, or is this, you know, or should we keep the microthrombosis separate from the macrothrombosis? Next slide. So, you know, this discussion of high dead space ARDS, high compliant ARDS, is it really that different in COVID than it is to the other forms of ARDS that we, we've um, been used to seeing and treating? Um, so this is a paper from a number of experts, but um, our, our friend Jeremy Beitler, who was here at UCSD and left to go to um, Columbia, uh, was one of the authors on this. And um, next, uh, advance. So this is a, a, a quote from this paper that I really liked because um, it says, reports of phenotypic heterogeneity in patients with COVID-19 associated ARDS, although interesting, could easily be overinterpreted or inappropriately applied in the ICU, potentially leading to detrimental ventilatory management strategies in these patients. So not only do I think that, that this focus on the high compliance, high uh, dead space patients could lead to changes in the typical vent management for ARDS, I think it has led to some people wanting to be more aggressive with anticoagulation um, to treat the, that, that dead space um, and try and um, you know, reduce the dead space by other mechanisms besides using a ventilator. Um, next slide. So whenever we're thinking about being more aggressive with anticoagulation, we have to balance that with changes or increases in risk of bleeding complications. Um, this is a, a study from the partners group um, in Boston, 400 patients with COVID-19. Um, they showed a VTE rate of 7.6% among the critically ill patients in the ICU. So not that high. Um, you know, that, that is a, a, a VTE rate that's sort of on par with uh, a lot of the, the large um, prophylactic trials um, in, in other um, uh, like the uh, PREVENT trial for adult apparent in the ICU. Um, so it, it's high, but it's not um, so astronomically high for the macro thrombosis um, that, that I think we really need to um, rush to treating these patients differently. Um, the flip side of the coin is the bleeding risk. Um, and in their study, they saw 5.6% of the critically ill patients have major bleeding complications. So um, we really, need, before we rush to changing our anticoagulation paradigms, we need to think about both the risks and benefits of, of that intervention. Next slide. And really, um, there is not a need to, to do this outside of a clinical trial. Um, there are lots of clinical trials um, ongoing, um, over 30 NIH-sponsored clinical trials currently ongoing. Um, this is a, a partial list from September, um, but it's, it's even more uh, now. And uh, next slide. I wanted to highlight the um, Operation Warp Speed. So this is our uh, tax dollars at work. Um, we have uh, three uh, of these active four um, um, trials um, that are focusing on different um, antithrombotic paradigms. The active four inpatient protocol is looking at therapeutic versus, versus prophylactic anticoagulation in 2,000 hospitalized patients, um, looking at this need for uh, organ support at 21 days um, as the primary endpoint. And their anticipated um, study completion is, is in uh, March of 2021. So we should be seeing results from a large clinical trial fairly soon. A number of those trials on the other page um, are ending in the next month or two. So we should be having more data to support this decision. 
Active 4 um, is actually the outpatient protocol, um, looking at 7,000 patients, whether or not they should get aspirin versus a pixivan versus placebo to prevent the need for hospitalization. And then there's a, a convalescent protocol looking at um, uh, whether or not patients after a COVID-19 hospitalization should go home with anticoagulation. Um, so I think, you know, more data is coming and, and um, I think you know, we'll, we'll have data to enlighten our clinical decision-making fairly soon. All right, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> so a couple of more points before we get to the, uh, to the um, uh, clinical cases. Um, so one is that there have been some reports about serological markers for thrombosis. And you know, when you hear serological and thrombosis together, the, the thing to be thinking about is antiphospholipid antibodies. Uh, and uh, there have been, there's a little bit of a preliminary data um, out about uh, maybe COVID patients have some of those antiphospholipid antibodies and might put them at some risk for thrombosis. Um, I'm not, I think this data is a bit preliminary, but I want to go through it uh, with you just, just so that you can have heard it. Um, so there is, the, it is the case that, um, you know, a, a large number of COVID patients do have these antibodies, but the antibodies are primarily what you're seeing there, the, the prothrombin antibodies, and the anticardiolipin uh, antibodies are really making up the lion's share of these antibodies. <clears throat> uh, but on the other hand, lots and lots of viral infections um, are responded to by the body by making a ton of different types of antibodies. And so you can go down with all these different um, uh, um, uh, uh, acute viral, acute and chronic viral infections there and see that an awful lot of those people are positive for some sort of antiphospholipid antibody uh, and not all of them are associated with VTE. In fact, um, it's relatively unusual for somebody with a viral infection and viral associated uh, uh, antiphospholipid antibodies to get um, a, a thrombosis as a result. Um, another thing about these antibodies is that they tend to be tested um, early on. So I hope you can see the detail on this, but, but most of these elevated antibodies, those are anti-cardiolipin antibodies and uh, you know, anti-glycoprotein antibodies, anti-thrombin antibodies, those are all um, being tested high in really in the first week or two of, of uh, hospitalization with relatively low values after that. Um, and we know that typically the, um, it's the persistent anticardiolipin antibodies and the antiprothrombin antibodies are the ones that are really associated with VTE. And typically we don't really uh, take it, uh, one of those things seriously in a, a pulmonary embolism patient until we see that it's a persistent elevation of those antibodies. And you can see um, the odds ratio is actually quite low um, for people that don't have persistent um, antibodies. Um, and that's why the definition, the consensus definition of antiphospholipid syndrome is always having um, two or more um, uh, blood draws that show the, uh, the antibodies high and they're typically uh, 12 weeks apart, so three months apart. Um, and you can see that those, those early studies really don't show those at all. They really show them just you know, acutely and then possibly going down. So I'm not sure how seriously I would take the, the um, a marker of the antiphospholipid antibody in the acute setting. And I think I would, I would um, probably treat these people regardless of the result of that. Uh, um, so, um, and that, finally, I want to focus a little bit on some epidemiological studies because uh, I think that these, these things really came out, and this is a typical study um, in the literature um, regarding um, uh, the presence of acute pulmonary embolism, the one that we're all used to, the big, you know, fat, you know, thrombus formed someplace else, went through the veins, ended up in the pulmonary arteries, that type of pulmonary embolism. Um, and there's uh, several different studies that look kind of like this. And so what this group did is they looked at a, a bunch of CT scans across multiple hospital sites. You can see that over about a, about a, a course of a month and they got 1500. So these were multiple different hospitals. And then they excluded a whole bunch of them that were done for different reasons, et cetera. And they found some that were associated with the person having COVID. And then they divided them up into people that had acute PE and didn't have acute PE. And, and that was widely interpreted as um, a conclusion that 22% of COVID patients 
um, have pulmonary embolism. Um, but, but I think the missing part of this is that these are only people that had a clinical reason for having a CT scan. So, you know, out of those, you know, the whatever number of that's, it looks like a little bit over 315 patients, COVID patients who had CT scans, there may have been thousands that did not have CT scans. Um, and, and so, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a biased sample. It's kind of a skewed, enriched sample if you're only going to look at people that you have a suspicion for pulmonary embolism on. Um, and in fact, if you were to look at other studies, non-COVID studies like the Wells study and those sorts of things where they looked at, at people in whom uh, the suspicion was um, either um, intermediate suspicion or high suspicion for having a pulmonary embolism based on their pretest probability that those patients actually had um, rates of PE that are quite comparable to what we're seeing here. And I borrowed this one, this slide here from Dr. Uh, Nick uh, uh, Calistegui uh, Cristani, who I believe is, is on uh, part of this conference and listening in. And he and his, his uh, uh, colleague, Jenny Zhu, had done a ton of work to look at, um, at the, uh, these reports. And it, we, if we separate them out into um, uh, studies where um, the, the authors took a retrospective review of scans only and used as the denominator people who had CT scans for clinical reasons alone and then looked at, uh, for, with COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> and we look at the percent of PE on those, it looks like it's an enormous percent. But if you go on the left side over here, where you look only at randomized controlled trials, where they took all comers and, and then, uh, you know, they had COVID-19 and then followed them, and they followed them quite carefully for adverse events, um, but they didn't have a suspicion for pulmonary embolism at the beginning, that those uh, incidences are actually quite low. And as Dr. Uh, Fernandez was saying, uh, comparable to what you would see in patients without COVID-19. So I'm, I, I don't think that there's a strong amount of data Data there that COVID-19 patients, um, either uh, regular admitted patients on the ward or people uh, in the ICU have a profoundly increased risk of having uh, pulmonary embolism compared to equally ill people without COVID-19. And with that, we're going to go to the case presentations. And let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Bond, who is a fellow in at uh, the Pulmonary Critical Care uh, Division at UC San Diego and has had some experience with, um, with uh, th these issues and is gonna present a couple of cases for us. So Dan? Yep, uh, so I'm Dan Bond. I'm one of the second year fellows at uh, UCSD. Uh, we can go next slide. Um, so for our first case, we had a 53 year old male with a history of hypertension and hyper hyperlipidemia who presented to the emergency department here at uh, UCSD with progressive shortness of breath um, and had recently been diagnosed with COVID-19 six days prior to presenting. Next. Um, so his admission, uh, his admission vitals were, uh, his temperature was 100.9 Fahrenheit, his heart rate was 69, uh, his blood pressure was normal, his respiratory rate, he was a little tachypnic at 30 and he was setting 94% on room air. Uh, his BMI was 31.6. Uh, next. Um, so his physical exam, he was, this was done by the admitting medicine team, uh, but was essentially an unremarkable physical exam. Next, uh, for his initial labs, um, so his CBC was fairly unremarkable, um, normal white count, normal hemoglobin, normal platelets with a normal diff. Uh, his BMP was also fairly unremarkable. Um, his liver enzymes were normal except for a mildly elevated AST at 49 and ALT at 52. Um, and he had a pro BNP done on admission that was 67. Uh, we have a fifth generation troponin, uh, which was six, which was in the normal range. <clears throat> and he also had a D dimer that was 221 that was also in the normal range. Uh, a rapid COVID assay was done as well and that was positive. Uh, so his initial chest X-ray uh, on admission was obtained. So this is um, uh, AP portable uh, semi-erect chest X-ray. Uh, it basically shows uh, diffuse bilateral, uh, predominantly perif peripheral uh, alveolar infiltrates um, which was consistent with the diagnosis of COVID-19. So any, any other comments from our other experts about the chest CT or the chest film here? Looks pretty typical for COVID. <clears throat> okay, I agree. Uh, so for his hospital course, he was initially admitted, admitted to the uh, medicine team here at UCSD. Uh, he was started on remdesivir uh, on admission uh, and was initially saturating well on room air. Uh, the 
the first night he was admitted uh, overnight, he started requiring two to three liters uh, of oxygen via na nasal cannula to maintain a saturation greater than 88%. Um, and then on hospital day four, uh, he continued to have increasing oxygen requirement overnight. Uh, he was now requiring an on breather, which is typically the threshold that we evaluate patients for ICU admission. Uh, so the ICU team had evaluated him at that point and he was transferred to the ICU. Uh, he was also started on dexamethasone, six milligrams daily at that time. Uh, and then over the next several days, he remained on a non rebreather. Uh, he was intermittently self-proning uh, and still had some occasional desaturations as well. Um, so on hospital day nine, he was again evaluated. Uh, he was noted to have some increased work of breathing and be mildly tachypnic as well. Uh, and was also noted to have a significantly elevated D-dimer compared to his prior. And I think the trend is on here. Um, so he was part of a clinical trial uh, where D-dimer was regularly checked as part of the clinical trial protocol. Uh, and the trend is noted below, but basically it had trended up from uh, the low 200s initially to 800 and then up to 6,000. Uh, and that was over about a 10 day course. Next. So let me um, stop there and say that we were at a, uh, a decision point on, on this gentleman. So. Uh, to summarize, his oxygenation is getting worse. And uh, at the same time, it's not that people were looking for it, but he was part of a clinical trial where that mandated the uh, D-dimer uh, uh, assay. And the D-dimer assay went up uh, rather abruptly from you know, the 200s up into 800, and then a few days later up into the you know, 6,000 range. So um, uh, any comments from our experts about how you would consider that uh, and what your next steps would be? Uh, this is Vic Tim. I, I would just say, first of all, I want to say uh, thanks for everyone listening in. I, I was looking at the chat box. We have people from all over the U.S., North America, South America, even Kenya, all kinds of places. So thanks for joining. Um, um, to me, to me, I think the concern is, uh, is, is this COVID or not? Is this PE? And um, uh, D-dimer might be a clue. It could be macroscopic PE, but without the D-dimer test, this kind of increased oxygenation, if the chest x-ray wasn't worse, especially, uh, I'd be considering PE. I'll just be brief there. I think the only other point I would make, it's, you know, you know the, the arc of his disease, he was kind of stable, and then he sort of abruptly got worse. Clinically, we don't have follow-up imaging to know is this is pneumonia progressing? I mean, I would say that, you know, the sort of late, rather abrupt deterioration clinically would obviously raise your suspicion for an, a, a PE um, as opposed to just sort of a steady decline. And certainly, you know, the imaging might help point you in one direction or the other. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is a guy who's been sick in an ICU for more than a week. Um, he is the prime setup for, for a hospital acquired VTE. So, um, it needs to be on the differential, pretty high in the differential, especially if there's not evidence of his COVID worsening. Um, let me ask Rich and Vic, um, you know, sometimes uh, in these COVID patients, it is tough to establish that PE diagnosis, the, the usual sort of Wells criteria and checking a D-dimer and all that um, is, is difficult to interpret in these patients who may have an elevated D-dimer to 6,000 for other reasons. Um, what are you guys, are you guys following D-dimers? Is that something that you, you're doing at UCLA and Sears? Uh, we certainly are. We aren't necessarily following them daily, but we follow them. <clears throat> and in some clinical trials we're doing, it's required. Um, and, and sometimes it does make you start thinking about PE maybe a little sooner than you would otherwise. In, in this patient, again, I'm D-dimer or not, uh, I, I would be concerned and want to look for PE, either just with CTA, since as you, as you know, our, some of our scoring criteria don't predict as well in hospitalized patients. Um, at Cedars, we, you know, we, have, we have really good three-view ventilation and perfusion scans that are portable, and we can't move someone sick with a portable VQ. And we found that those VQ scans, even with, with ARDS, unless you have dense consolidation, will often get a result that at least tells us whether we think that the, the deterioration can be explained by PE or not, especially if it's hypotension on pressors, and we see one little segmental mismatch, we know it's not PE causing the problem. So there's a couple of ways we go here, but yeah, I, I think um, we'd have a low threshold to, to, to image. So let me ask all the experts here. Um, I think this is a really, um, this, this is a very vexing problem in the face of COVID-19 because um, COVID-19 has a, uh, the clinical course of COVID-19 does tend to be a bit silent. 
and, and uh, can present as relatively mild disease. And most people, when they arrive at the emergency department are not arriving in extremists and they mostly come in with mild disease and uh, they either rapidly progress during that day uh, or more commonly in our experience, they may end up on the floor for a while. And, and you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, up in the air about whether they're going to go home in a few days and live to tell the story about it or whether they're going to get worse. And then they when they get worse, they they will, um, you know, um, have us, you know, steady and progressive deterioration. So. Um, typically, it's in hospital day or, you know, infection day somewhere around day 10 or so is when people start to really end up deteriorating. And the problem, the vexing problem is that we're so used to people coming in with a terrible pneumonia. And if you're, you know, and your, your worst day is your first day and then you get better. And then if you worsen during your course, you say, oh, I know this is pulmonary embolism. But in my experience with COVID-19 is almost all of them were not so sick and then got sick. And if we're gonna have as a criteria, um, the development of really bad hypoxemia, you know, during your hospital stay, then every single one is gonna get worked up. So let me ask you you guys, um, what, uh, what, what um, differentiates things and what makes you think especially, oh boy, this is the one I wanna work up for PE. You know, I mean, I wish we had a clear answer to that or a clear algorithm. We obviously don't, which is why we're here tonight. That's obviously the dilemma. I mean, the D-dimer data, as you know, is a little bit muddy and, and I don't think we can use it to track, you know, to, to change to a great degree the clinical suspicion. I think there's obviously other factors. It still gets down to, to basic physiology. I mean, obviously, if you find DVT, that would be useful. But, you know, I think we, we don't clearly have the answer. I mean... If the imaging is worsening and you there's you know other parameters make you think of more clot versus not clot you know i think you'd need to have a fairly low threshold for imaging i think that you know with with protocols now i mean i think we're pretty good i think our initial concern about not taking anyone to the scanner has been a little bit allayed and i, I think we have a lower threshold i mean it'd be nice if we had a portable perfusion scan but we don't at ucla i don't think many people have it so um you know, we'll just scan them. Great. Any other comments before we move on? Yeah, I don't think anybody around a, anybody around a um, low threshold for scanning, a COVID or not, and someone like that. Um, it's hard to use D-dimer alone, but when there's a clinical change, I think we're, I think we're kind of stuck. I mean, we see this in COVID and non-COVID, so I think we, we have to strongly consider it. Now, 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 again, like Rich pointed out, we don't have to necessarily um, anticoagulate empirically for long periods of time before we can, we can rule something in or out, uh, which is good. Like we did it first, we did that sometimes for days. There was yeah. a question in the chat about um, prophylaxis. Um, and typically here we, um, I, th I think this patient was on heparin, um, 5,000 yes. uh, uh, Q8 hours. Um, we have been mostly using um, uh, anoxaparin and um, there are some patients where we, like the, the larger BMI, where we go up on the dose, but for the most part, it's, it's standard dosing. Let's come back to prophylaxis in a bit here. Um, so why don't we move on so we can get to all the, all the uh, information here. Um, so uh, Dan, would you want to take us through this scan? Sure. Um, so a CTPE was obtained um, and we can see here in the right lower lobe in one of the segmental branches, there's a acute clot. Uh, and he also had, so the, the CT itself showed acute pulmonary thromboembolism in the right lower lobe, segmental and subsegmental branches, um, as well as the, yep. And then the, this is the kind of just looking at the RV to LV ratio and it was normal. Uh, and then there was no evidence of reflex of contrast into the hepatic vein. Good. So, um, any mm. thoughts about, about, um, whether that, if you move back into this slide here, whether that could be one of those in situ thrombi, or do you think at this clot, I mean, because if you look at it, it's in an area that, that even on this uh, mediastinal window, looks like there's a fair amount of lung parenchymal disease, or do you think that we should be saying, you know, ignore that, and if you see something inside the embola or artery, and it's that big, you should probably treat it like it's an embolic disease, which means that the second one might be coming if we don't do something about it. Well, I, I don't know. I would just say, I think this, I, I would have a low threshold to anticoagulate, but I, I don't think this 
this symbolic burden, what we see here is causing the problem. I think this is coincident, whether it's embolic or in situ, it's coincident, not causing the problem. So I think the CT is helpful here. Um, you know, we don't need systemic, we don't need systemic lytics for this, I don't think, unless we think there's enough microscopic thrombosis here that we can't see. And that's one of the tough questions too. Okay. Okay. Um, so Dan? Yep, so um, the patient was started on IV heparin drip. Um, a lower extremity ultrasound was performed that did not show any evidence of DVT. Um, and basically over the next several days, the oxygen was gradually weaned down to nasal cannula. Um, in, on hospital day 11, he was transferred out of the ICU. Um, he was transitioned from heparin to apixaban on the floor, and then he was discharged home on hospital day 15 on room air. Good. So any final comments about this guy? Uh, one might be how long would you treat? And uh, again, I think I, I would say, even though his legs were negative, we know half, half of people with PEs that are embolic have, have negative legs. I'd have a low threshold if it was safe and there was no significant bleeding risk to treat him for a full three months at least, uh, uh, like I would a, a, D, a PE. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I don't know whether we'll ever know whether uh, this guy had an insight to thrombus, in which case you would say, well, you know, the odds of that happening again are pretty slim unless he gets another, you know, horrible, uh, you know, ARDS, or whether this was, uh, you know, truly the hospital acquired BTE. Uh, but I think that, that uh, after the first week or so of anticoagulation, the risk of for the remaining time uh, during therapy is quite low compared to the risk of getting a re-thrombosis and I, I think I would do the same thing. I would treat him for, for the whole duration. I mean, the, the follow-up of these patients is really obviously critical. And, you know, one of the questions we have is, you know, how do they, are they more likely to go on to develop chronic PE? You know, what, I mean, obviously you have the parenchymal stuff that can impair their functional recovery, but it, I think it creates a very interesting, you know, study that needs, that we need to look at these patients who've had even small PEs and what happens late to them, you know, maybe they shall be getting follow-up BQ scans at some point. Yeah. I don't know what you're doing, Tim. Uh, we, we have not been doing that, but, but just because, you know, the, the, uh, the disease is young enough that we haven't had a whole lot of them come back, uh, but I think that's a really excellent idea. Okay, Dan, why don't we go to case two? Yep. Um, so this is a 34-year-old man. Uh, he has a history, next. Uh, a poorly controlled non-insulin dependent uh, type two diabetes and hypertension. Uh, he was transferred from an outside hospital uh, with COVID-19 ARDS uh, for consideration of VV ECMO to our facility. Um, so he was admitted to the outside hospital after one week of dyspnea. Uh, at the outside hospital, he received remdesivir, dexamethasone and convalescent plasma for treatment of his COVID-19. Um, on hospital day 12, he was intubated and on hospital day 15, he was transferred to UCSD for consideration of uh, VV ECMO. Um, so this is his x-ray after he was cannulated for ECMO, I think on, this, on hospital day 15. Um, you can see that there's diffuse, um, both peripheral and central opacities. Uh, he has an ECMO cannula in his right IJ, uh, an endotracheal tube is present. Um, I don't think we can, he has a right IJ, right FEM uh, cannulation. I don't think we can clearly see the right FEM cannula on this x-ray. So one of, one of the salient features, I think, of this, this film is something that's missing, which is that there doesn't really seem to be any signs of lober consolidation that you would expect to see with bacterial superinfection. And, uh, you know, maybe as an aside, I think that we treat an awful lot of these people with antibacterials, and I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of evidence to suggest that that's a big problem with these guys. I think these are just primary viral infections. But anybody see anything else on this film? Yeah, he was treated with antibiotics kind of intermittently throughout, but didn't have culture positive data till like very close to the end of his course. Yeah, when we, um, when we put these people on ECMO, we, we typically use the 10-10-10, the like the low tidal volumes, um, low driving pressures, um, just trying to keep them expanded, but not um, too collapsed. And when we do that, then we typically need to go in and uh, do bronchoscopy just to clear their secretions. Um, and so then we have multiple opportunities to get cultures. Uh, I think he, he did end up growing, um, you know, uh, uh, something over the course of his, his stay. Okay. Um, so again, I guess the x-ray we just showed for the ECMO cannulation, but he was cannulated on hospital day 16. His PDF at that time was 55 and that was 
with paralytics and proning. Uh, when we cannulate people for ECMO, our protocol is to put them on a heparin drip and we follow 10 A's with a goal, 10 A of 0.11 to 0.3. Um, and he was maintained on the heparin drip basically throughout the course. On hospital day 26, he had a percutaneous tracheostomy performed. Uh, he did have some oozing from his trach site following this, uh, and the heparin drip was held from uh, the 20, from hospital day 26 to 29. Um, by the way, just just for for people's information, so if you don't if you're not used to a whole lot of uh, titration of heparin by uh, the action against 10A, actually is anti 10A. Um, usually, the that 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 scale right there is kind of a lower scale. So if you were treating somebody, uh, the, the, uh, you know, when you're treating an acute pulmonary embolism or something like that, you would tend to be going for APDT is that were, you know, two to two and a half, something like that times the control, which is uh, uh, the equivalent of an anti 10 a level of about 0.3 to 0.7. So that's on the lower side of things, uh, not, not, not really up in the treatment ranges here. So uh, he starts oozing even, you know, despite that level of heparin. Are you using that predominantly now, Tim, rather than PTT, or just in this case, these case, ECMO cases? For the ECMO cases, yeah. But not for routine IV heparin. Some no. people are, I know, using Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. Yeah, we use, we use heparin levels alone, 10 A's for, alone for heparin. We don't use PTTs now. And we found they don't seem to match often, which is kind of scary. Yeah. I mean, you know, you presented some data on the antifossil lipid antibodies, and, and when we see patients come for their, their CTEF uh, uh, PT surgery here, um, we see quite a bit of antiphospholipid antibodies and those patients have prolonged PTTs at, at baseline. So, you know, it's tough to know what his PTT was. He was on ECMO the whole time and he was anticoagulated the whole time, but, you know, the anti-10A is a direct measure of enzymatic activity independent of the baseline PTT. So that's, I think that's why we like it. Yeah, the, 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 I guess the, the trouble with the anti 10A is that you are uh, to do the experiment, you add, you know, a store bought factor uh, uh, antithrombin. Uh, so um, so it, it's kind of adjusts for the antithrombin uh, amount, which maybe you could say that's a great thing or maybe it's a bad thing, but it's the, you're isolating, it's a heparin level itself. It's not the activity of heparin, it's just the amount that you have in there. Yeah, so let's move on. We do periodically check anti thrombin three levels um, on ECMO because you know the, the circuit can consume some. Right. Um, so basically, over the next thirty days, from hospital day thirty to sixty, uh, he continued to require ECMO support, pretty significant support, with about six liters per minute of flow and a sweep of six to eight liters per minute. Um, and then his pulmonary compliance during this time as well was uh, 10 to 20. And that's again, using, I think most of the time he was on 10, 10, 10, which is a 10 to peep 10 of driving pressure and 10 of respiratory rate. Um, so on, on hospital day 57, uh, this is over the weekend. He had an acute episode of hypotension. Um, he had previously been on no vasopressors. Uh, he actually had been on some Esmolol, uh, but now is requiring norepinephrine at 26 micrograms per minute, epinephrine at 0.06 micrograms per kilogram per minute and phenylephrine at 200 micrograms per minute. Uh, and that was in addition to IV fluid boluses. Uh, and he was felt too unstable for transport for imaging. So do we even have a portable chest x-ray at that time or do we have anything? No, no, what does x-ray look worse? Or? Um, his x-ray, I, I don't have an x-ray on the slide, but it was essentially unchanged. He didn't have like a pneumothorax or any acute uh, abnormality that we, you know, noted. Gotcha. So any, any further comments, if, if you were, guys were there uh, at the moment that this all happened, what would, you, what would your next steps be? Boy, it's, it's almost two months in the hospital. It's, it's, it'd be, it's almost shocking that the guy doesn't have a clot by now, I, again, COVID or not. Um, but uh, um, again, we, we would, again, at Cedars, and I, I do realize there's, a, I think there's less than 100 centers in the country that do good quality portable VQ scans. But that, we'd probably do that, realizing we might not get an answer, but we might get a big wedge defect. Or we might get really good perfusion for some reason, in spite of the fact that he's got bad ARDS. And so it could be helpful. It could be helpful telling us whether the pressure requirements from PE or not. Might not. I'd definitely scan his legs. I'm doing portable ultrasound on his legs and see if anything there. Uh, whether that would help uh, make a decision about really aggressive therapy for PE or not, I don't know. Uh, definitely be great to have a little more information. That's tough. And we have a... We have an answer for this, actually. So one of the things, and we published a, a brief report of this, is um, by we, I mean 
my wife, who's an interventional pulmonologist, or the other Dr. Chanik, we started doing EBIS in these patients. And, and it turns out you can really, you can visualize out to the, she does them, I don't know, out to the low bar level, um, the pulmonary vasculature through EBIS. You need typically an eight ET tube, but we have some like amazing images. And it was just in this kind of scenarios, ECMO patients that can't be transported, where she, we've diagnosed several pretty large PEs that were suspected. So, you know, obviously with COVID, by this point, you may probably is no, negative, I would assume, hopefully not infectious. Um, I would, again, refer to our, to our chest publication. And we have another series coming out of using endobronchial ultrasound in just this kind of scenario for patients who can't be transported. That's a great one. But the other thing, uh, someone, uh, Gerbian pointed out uh, on the chat, uh, chat box there to look for right heart strain with POCUS. Absolutely, it's easy to do. This patient's probably gonna have a bad right heart, but if the right heart looked really good, you're not explaining 25 mics of levofed with, <laughs> with, from a PE. Um, speaking of ultrasound, one thing we did in ni early 1990s, I remember going from the MICU to the CCU, we've done some IVIS. I was in high school, I was in high school then. Dick, did I say that? Maybe it was late 90s. But uh, I remember going to the CCU to get an IVIS. I heard they had a thing called an IVIS catheter, intravascular ultrasound. And we used it in animals for a PE model. So I went and got the one from the CCU, went down to the MICU. We, we put it in a little sheath in the neck and we diagnosed a PE in the main PA with IVIS. So there are some things you would bedside. I mean, Rich, what you did was really cool. I mean, that you can bronx somebody. But again, you got a sheath, got a big enough sheath and somebody can run a, a, the IVIS catheters aren't too big now and might be another possibility for bedside uh, bedside diagnosis. This guy's on 25 mics of fed again. You're going to see something in the main PA or the lobar PAs if it's macroscopic PE, if it's some COVID microscopic PE thing, who knows? A good point. I, I think we all agree uh, an echocardiogram would be uh, really helpful, well, you know, one way or the other. If, if, you, if you're not seeing right ventricular findings, then it's going to be hard to explain that, uh, that uh, norepinephrine uh, and epinephrine requirement, right? Okay, Dan? Uh, so there was concern for possible PE. Um, he was empirically started on uh, therapeutic heparin uh, treatment, which would be, this is the high bleeding risk protocol for us, which would be 0.2 to 0.45, uh, 10A. Um, and then a CTPA uh, was eventually performed. Uh, he came, his pressure requirement kind of came down over the next day. Um, unfortunately, the bolus timing was poor and he had a lot of uh, respiratory motion artifacts. Um, but kind of in the right P, uh, PA here, there was some question of a possible um, filling defect concerning for a PE. Yeah, that's a hard one there. I, I think that the right uh, P, uh, PA, which is, I, I don't know if you can see it in your, on your computers, this area right here that I'm surrounding my pointer is just so prone towards artifact. And you can see the artifact streaking all the way across, you know, the, 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 uh, the chest going this way that I think it's, it's quite hard in this region here. This looks a little bit suspicious here, but this is also an area where without being able to scroll up and down and without mm -hmm. the person holding perfectly still, you could say, well, you know, this is the edge of the pulmonary artery over here, which would be a little bit odd to be that close to the trachea, or maybe this is just the edge of the pulmonary artery. So I would say that this scan is a non-diagnostic scan, but how, how do the other participants feel? That's a really tricky spot in the right PA, which uh, you're right, Tim. Right by the airway there, right where the PA starts to branch there, it's a tricky area. It's that uh, a lot of um, unexperienced eyes will call a PE there. Um, so you really gotta be cautious right where the, the PA turns a little bit there. Yeah. Well, one other- the, the, the lung in that area is really densely consolidated. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're not ventilating that lung, should you be even perfusing it? And, and is this a pulmonary embolism or is this in situ thrombosis? If, they're, if they are calling something there, I, I'm not convinced it's yeah. embolic disease. Um, yeah, good. Um, so for the RV to LV, there was evidence of increasing right heart dilation with flattening of the intraventricular septum, uh, which was concerning for a finding of pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that, Dan. I, I, unfortunately, you know, the, the ARDS itself, I think, and if that uh, abruptly gets worse, can end up with the same exact findings. And I think the echo is notoriously terrible at diagnosing PE. It's great for grading its severity, but it's terrible for diagnosing it. It's interesting physiology, not to get into the weeds, but, you know, you think about the, the ECMO patient on six liters of flow, mm -hmm. you know, it depends on what his intrinsic flow is, but if it suddenly decreases, you might actually see that as a, an improvement in his oxygenation as he flows yep. more through the circuit. 
that actually happened too. His oxygenation got better. Um, but part of it was he also got more bradycardic as well. Uh, and then this is just an, another slide showing there was some reflux into the hepatic vein. So physiologically, the right ventricle and the right atrium must have been at high pressure. Um, again, a nonspecific finding, but it just looked like there's right ventricular um, failure for some reason. Uh, and then just a couple of echo kind of, so the echo was obtained uh, the following day as well. Um, so he had, he had an echo about 20 days prior to this that had a normal, um, no, you know, normal RVSP with no evidence of RV dysfunction. Um, so this echo showed his LV was normal, his LV function was normal, his RV was moderately enlarged, and as you can see, it doesn't fit on the screen. Um, and there was, the systolic function was reduced. Um, he had moderate to severe tricuspid regurg, and he had severe pulmonary hypertension with an RVSP of 80. Um, and then on the left here, we also, there was evidence of this large linear echodensity in the RA that may be attached to the eustachian, eustachian valve that was concerning for um, thrombus. So um, I would say uh, because it looks like it is attached up in exactly where the eustachian valve would be, and, and that's, that's not supposed to be there, right? That's, a, that's an embryological um, remnant. Um, uh, anything wiggling around inside the right atrium that looks like it's got that type of origin, I would be very cautious about overcalling that, you know, because, you know, Chiari networks and, you know, eustachian valves and all kinds of different ridges and funny remnants can be there and it can end up fooling you. Um, so I, I would be, and, and it's doesn't look it's, like it's, it's uh, come from the Oracle, which is why often where a clot will kind of wiggle around inside. Um, I would be, uh, skeptical about this one being a, a uh, actual, you know, clutch in transit. I mean, in our uh, PTE patients, we have definitely seen prominent Chiari networks with chronic um, PE in transit uh, sort of uh, caught in that network. So yeah, I wouldn't rule it out. Um, you know, your point's taken, but I wouldn't rule it out. Okay. It's helpful. You'd want to see different views. If you had a TE, that'd be helpful. Um, if you see a giant 10 centimeter clot flopping around the tricuspid valve, it's easy, but when it's small, it can be tricky. Yeah, I, I wouldn't make a diagnosis solely based on that image, but uh, you want to look closely if you could. Good. Um, so he did have serial uh, TTEs performed with, there was concern for actually RV thrombus too, but the RV was even more questionable um, reviewing the images with the cardiologist yesterday. Um, but basically, uh, while on therapeutic heparin, his platelets dropped from 250 to 120 uh, over a four-day course. A PF4 antibody test was performed. It was 0.446 with a normal less than 0 0.400. And it was transitioned to a bival rudin drip with a goal PTT of 60 to 90 at that point. Comments about that? Well, don't want to don't want to miss hit. That's for sure. Um, uh, so reasonably, in, until you're certain, you <laughs> empiric change to bival rudin seems reasonable um, there. Um, and whether you need to do anything more for this patient in terms of uh, VTE therapy, I don't think we know for sure yet. Um, we can blame a lot on that bad consolidation ARDS. Uh, I guess one question would be: Would you do anything different for PE here? And I think without, you know, it'd be nice to know for sure what's going on if, if there is a clot in transit or not. Uh, yeah, Someone in the chat brought up a good point about the RV, just to underscore it. I mean, as you know, somebody with COVID and bad lung injury, you know, is very frequently going to have a dilated dysfunctional RV. So, you know, that's much more, much more likely to be something other than PE in this case is just lung injury and RV strain. If we didn't have this patient on anticoagulation now, I would want to empirically anticoagulate to get a better answer. But like Rich said, this doesn't mean this patient has PE. That big RV does not mean PE. It bothers you, but doesn't mean PE for sure. Yeah, maybe just one uh, kind of minority re report uh, comment about the, the HID is I know that we commonly will say, well, if you have a suspicion for it, <clears throat> you should stop the heparin or the low molecular weight heparin and treat with other stuff. I, I, my experience, though, is that with things like our gatraban, we just don't have that bullseye as well as we do with the other anticoagulants. There are, just aren't giant studies about the risk benefits of dose adjustments, et cetera, with those things. So I think that while, while I do the same thing and I switch them off, 
Um, it, it makes me a little nervous um, when we use a different anticoagulant because I feel like I've, uh, you know, a little bit like driving without the headlights on. Yeah, no, do we have an SRA in this patient for HIT? I mean, or do we just have the PF4? Uh, eventually okay. they did. And uh, eventually we can't, well, Dan, I don't want to steal your, your story. So um, what happened eventually? Sure. You want to do the next slide or? Um, so his pupils were noted to be, his left pupil was noted to be fixed and dilated on hospital day 66. Um, next. So a CT head was obtained. Um, he had a, unfortunately a, a massive uh, seven centimeter left frontal parenchymal hemorrhage with a 1.1 centimeter midline shift. Um, and then, uh, you know, following goals of care discussion, he was transitioned to comfort care and passed away on hospital day 71. Uh, his serotonin release assay was obtained. Uh, I think it came back negative though after this. Uh, so it was negative. Yeah, I, I, well, uh, let me well, let me pause there for comments from the experts. Well, I, th I think again, if he's still on ECMO and needs to be anticoagulated, I guess the question is could it's been avoided. But it does make you stop and think. You know, even in COVID, we're calling it a prothrombotic entity, and I think it is. But we should be pretty careful not to get too aggressive with it. We need to see the results of all these uh, anticoagulation studies Tim showed and yeah. see where we are before we empirically anticoagulate everyone. That's for sure. Uh, this patient's different. He needs to be anticoagulated. It's not like. Although sometimes, you know, you can run BV ECMO without significant anticoagulation. And actually, 10A levels were pretty low initially, at least. So. Okay. Um, so uh, it's, it's actually 6 o'clock, but I thought it would be nice for us to, you know, what I understand is that we can go a little bit over time here. And I thought it'd be nice to just... Uh, have a little bit of an open mic and we could either uh, address controversies within ourselves or um, we could take some questions from the chat box um, before we, before we close it up. Um, and I, I actually, on my screen, I can't actually see the chat box. I'm not sure why. So could I, could I um, ask one of the other participants to read through, see if there's any questions there, there that need discussion? There was a question from Anastasia about your guys' thoughts about using clopidogrel or aspirin for prevention of PE in these patients. Yeah, I, I just, this Vic, I just say we don't have, we don't have a lot of data. I think we, we know that there's platelet activation in sick people with platelet activation in COVID patients. Um, we know aspirin is better than nothing for preventing VTE. We know that from the Warfasa study, the Aspire study. But in this case, I would say it would not be as good as anticoagulation. And I think, you know, we just don't, the data right now would tell us it's not good enough. But in COVID, maybe is it? Maybe it would, maybe it's combined low-dose prophylaxis plus an antiplatelet drug the way to go? I don't think we know. It's a good question, I think. And that's, that's being explored in some of the clinical trials. Um, you know, the, the yeah. Fumi Network has a study that is um, prophylactic dose, Lovenox versus therapeutic. Um, and then a two by two design where you did clopidogrel or placebo. Um, you know, we've seen a number of bleeding complications here. This isn't the only one that we've seen. So, uh, you know, doing that outside of a clinical trial is very scary to me. And, and I think selecting the right patients to, to think uh, about enrolling would be key. But um, I, I definitely would not recommend clopidogrel outside of a clinical trial. Yeah, one more quick point too about the ECMO is I think, you know, you I would want I would want this patient on anticoagulation. I mean, I, I, you could decide where you want at 10A levels to be, but once he has the bleed, the horse is out of the barn, and then we can say, well, you don't need you don't need anticoagulation with ECMO. But I don't know. I think I guess the question would be, would you would you really want to try this patient off anticoagulation on ECMO before he had a bleed, unless there was a real contraindication to anticoagulation? So that's a question to throw 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 out there. Yeah, no, there's no right answer. Obviously, the you know, can, you know, every, you know, catheters clot in these patients. And so it's a, you know, a no win situation in some cases. Well, I, yeah. I think the, the, uh, the question about whether ECMO where anticoagulation, uh, it facilitates ECMO. Uh, it, it almost certainly does. And especially in these, in these patients where, where the, you know, the catheters and these little membranes, you know, et cetera, are, will eventually clot off. And that can actually be quite a, quite a, a deal for these guys. I think uh, the question is whether upping the dose and you know doubling the dose uh, for the treatment of pulmonary embolism is a good idea. And uh, you know I don't know. I mean I, honestly I, I I certainly have come around in my thinking 
from saying an absolute yes, because the frequency of PE is so high in these people that if you see something crazy and you can't confirm it, it's better to, to treat than not treat. But I think that I've tapped the brakes a bit on that after looking at more recent data and saying, you know, there's, I don't think there's anything about COVID-19 that makes me more likely to empirically treat somebody for PE than, than not. So there was a question in the chat and I'll, I'll pose it to Vic because I, I think you were part of Mariner. Um, what are you guys doing with people after their hospitalization with COVID-19? Are they going home on uh, a DOAC to prevent that late PE? Um, well, thanks, Tim. I, just very quickly, what I would say is that I don't think we have a lot of great data. We do, the UK data suggested we don't need to do it. Rates are low. I don't know if we have that answer quite yet. Uh, if you look at Mariner Magellan, uh, especially Magellan, when you, when you take out patients that are medically ill who don't have high risk for bleeding, clearly it paid off to anticoagulate patients with tenebs Ralto in those patients. What we do is we individualize patients when they go home, we consider 10 milligrams of rebaroxaban based on Mariner Magellan and the fact these patients have COVID, but I don't think we have proof all COVID patients need prophylaxis for a month after, after discharge. I think we need more information before we do that. So we cautiously individualized, realizing that fortunately, based on the Einstein Choice study, 10 milligrams of rebaroxaban appears to be, at least in the Einstein Choice population, equivalent to aspirin in terms of risk of major bleed. So we think it's reasonable in some of these patients. Laura, are there other uh, chat box questions? Mm -hmm. A um, couple questions about the intermediate dosing. Um, when to use, you know, just the regular thromboprophylaxis versus intermediate? So by intermediate, uh, I think that you're, uh, you're saying that there is, a, for, for one example, is the prophylactic dose of anoxaparin might be uh, a half milligram per kilogram once a day. And uh, there are some protocols where you would call for a doubling of that. So it would be a half milligram per kilogram twice a day or something in that range. Um, the data suggests that, that um, you know, now granted there, there has not been a randomized controlled trial that I'm aware of uh, uh, for COVID-19 about that comparison, but the data suggests that there isn't much of a signal when you're looking retrospectively at, uh, at, uh, at studies between people who got the double dose of anticoagulants versus not uh, the uh, you know the regular dose of anticoagulants. It doesn't seem to be um, protective, at least in an obvious sense that you can tell from retrospective study. So I, I'm not sure that it is um, a good idea to treat these people with a higher dose of prophylaxis than we normally would in the ICU. What do you guys do? I don't think we have the data. What we do is we do 40 venoxaparin once a day in all our COVIDs when they come in, just like any other acutely ill medical patient. When they go to the ICU, if they're sick, um, many of my colleagues feel very comfortable going to 40 twice a day as prophylaxis. We don't use therapeutic anticoagulation in these folks though, unless it's proven. I'm not saying that's the right answer. We, we need more data. Would you do the same thing, uh, uh, Vic, that with the 40 twice a day, if their COVID test came back negative and they were equally sick? That's a good question because I don't think I would. I wouldn't, you know, and, and so maybe that makes me, um, uh, maybe I'm contradicting myself there, but I do think we have enough information on COVID that's pro thrombotic, even though I don't think we have good anticoagulation guidelines. We can't say, I don't think we can say everyone needs therapeutic anticoagulation yet. Um, you know, the old New York data, some of the New York folks really got concerned and wanted to do this and they had some really impressive data initially, but that was in the first couple of months when COVID started, you know, 24% mortality in COVID patients and, uh, and a lot of clots, I think. So I think we've learned a lot since then, I'd say. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned that, that some of the uh, data that initially came out of Europe that was retrospective looks at like the ones that I showed before about people who had scans for reasons, you know, obviously for clinical reasons, and we're showing the high uh, um, uh, event rates for pulmonary embolism, that, that the conclusion of a lot of those studies were, we should double the dose of anticoagulant. And I think that we all um, jumped in on that. And I'm wondering whether we should tap the brakes and, and, and say like, well, you know, if there, if, if there isn't a special thing about COVID that makes you especially prone to PE, then maybe, you know, uh, that, that without evidence, maybe it is, was too um, uh, premature to jump, you know, to jump in and say, we're going to just, you know, double the dose of anticoagulants above what we know is effective for that reason. 
And this reminds me a lot of the old lung transplant days when we first started doing it. We just flew by the seat of our pants trying to figure out what to do. And I think that's kind of what we're doing now. I mean, to me, intuitively, it would make sense if someone's got a CRP of 300 and a ferritin of 6,000 and an IL-6 level, it's 100. I mean, and, and, and they go in the ICU and they're sicker. I mean, I would probably say that's enough to make me go to inter intermediate dose uh, prophylaxis, but I'd be the first to say I have no data to support it. Um, while Laura's looking for, for other uh, chat box questions, I, I, I will say that, you know, when we're going back on to our, um, what makes you do a, a workup for PE question, um, something that I think was really taken away from at least my own algorithm for this is, is uh, I like to, uh, to look at lung compliances and, and lung mechanics and say that if an ARDS patient um, has not changed his lung mechanics, but then suffers some really bad oxygenation problems, then I start to think about whether this is an additional circulatory problem. And that spurs me to do the, you know, more of the uh, acute pulmonary embolism workup. But <clears throat> I think COVID-19 has really messed that up, at least for me, because the endothelial problem is so common. That's exactly what that would do. It would, it would make you uh, have a worse oxygenation profile without changing a whole lot of the mechanics of air movement. Um, so, um, you know, I'm not sure I have a great answer either about wh which ones to work up, but I'm not um, as prone to saying, um, you know, if, if the compliance stays high and the oxygenation changes, that that's a PE until proven otherwise. I backed away from that. Uh, Laura, oh, what a great discussion. Uh, yeah, you guys have answered, I think, the majority of questions. So really appreciate your attention to all of these great questions in the chat box. Great. Well, give them, uh, give them Tim's cell number for the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Well, let me thank uh, Dr. Chanik had to go, but let me thank Dr. Chanik, uh, Dr. Tapson, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Bond uh, for a really fabulous discussion uh, about this. It was, re you're really generous with your time. And, and I think this was a really wonderful session. Great job. Thanks everybody. Thank Thanks Tim. Thank you, Dr. Morris. Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you Thanks. for the next one uh, in one week. All right. Thank you.